Welcome ACS members to tonight's launch of ACS's Australia's Digital Pulse 2020. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, streaming here from Barangaroo, that's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Very excited to have John Omani here tonight, um, partner from Deloitte Access Economics. John has been with us through the six year journey of uh, Digital Pulse, and we've got a really exciting edition tonight. Welcome, John. Good evening, Andrew. Why don't we kick straight into it? Um, yes. Sorry, before we do, as is always the case for our live stream series, please enter your questions at any time in the chat um, box of the YouTube channel, and we'll ask those throughout tonight, but specifically at the end, we'll make sure we get through as many questions as possible. So John, without more to do, what are the high level findings for this year's report? Thanks, Andrew. Yes, this is the sixth edition of the ACS Digital Pulse in this country. And this report has good news, but some alarming news as well. Uh, the first one, the first key headline is around the continued growth of Australia's information and communication technology workforce, its tech workforce. Um, dial the clock back to 2014 when we first produced this report with you. Um, we had 600,000 tech workers in this country. In our latest edition for 2019, we find there are some 772,000 tech workers in this country. It's huge growth. It's, it's double the rate of growth um, across the workforce more broadly um, over that period. And it's this big sign of strength in the Australian economy. We forecast that even with some uh, short term decline in tech workers because of the COVID-19 recession, we're going to have 929,000 tech workers in this country by 2025. So um, Australia's IT workforce growth is a really very positive story. Um, but it's not all good news in this report, um, unfortunately. Um, and and the, uh, the, most, the most sobering point comes from an international comparison. We compare Australia with 15 other countries um, around the world across 24 indicators of their, of their digital health. And we find that Australia is only a very middling country, uh, seven out of the 16 countries that we looked at. And compared with the assessment we did two years ago, Australia has not improved at all, even with this investment, even with this growth in the workforce. Uh, and therefore, in this report, like in previous editions, we make some humble suggestions for policymakers, for Canberra, for Macquarie Street, for state governments, about how they might use the COVID-19 recovery to help Australia be a digital leader. Fantastic. So let's uh, speak of COVID-19. Let's look at what has been the major significant economic implications since uh, COVID-19 started to really hit about mid-March. Mm. Yes, no, look, it's an extraordinary time in which we live and it's an extraordinary time to be doing this sort of research. The, uh, the macroeconomic indicators are all very poor. Um, we've, uh, we've, our economy in Australia, it's, it's shrunk by some six percentage points over the first half of this year. We've seen unemployment rise from just over 5% to, to almost 7%. Although I do note there'll be, there'll be some people um, uh, on the line tonight um, who'll have seen today's figures, which showed a small improvement um, in the August month, which is a good thing. Um, but we are expecting unemployment's gonna rise again before the end of this year and into next year um, as well. So uh, in terms of the economic fallout, probably more ahead of us than behind us so far, two thirds of businesses have lost revenue because of COVID-19. It's a very widespread impact. It's affecting business investment, it's affecting confidence, and of course, with the very significant spending that the government's been doing to help prop up our economy, it means that the budget, the federal budget, won't be in great shape for a few years. And, and, is, and as it moves to repair the budget by cutting spending or raising taxes uh, in coming years, that's gonna make it harder for people advocating new policies that might cost money um, to get them agreed to by the federal government. Now, we have a dedicated chapter on COVID-19 in this year's report. What have been your observations on how business has responded to those changing conditions? But business has responded very well to these changes. I mean, I think if COVID-19 had hit our economy five years ago or 10 years ago, it would have been much harder. But it's precisely because of the digital investments and Australia's IT workforce that we've been able to better withstand this crisis than might have otherwise been the case. And you can see it across a range of indicators. Think about the number of people working from home over the last six months. It's about 
half of Australia's workforce working from home during COVID-19, supported by all those, all those technologies, uh, Zoom, Teams, WebEx. Um, they might have been big names six months ago, but they are obviously household names now. Um, the growth in, in e-commerce, um, we note here some work that Australia Post has done to try to quantify that. I think it's something like $2.4 billion in extra e-commerce spending um, during the COVID-19 crisis. People don't want to go to stores. They want to just buy and have things delivered to their house. That's a very big change. Um, but there's also other, other changes in specific sectors, like in the, the healthcare sector or in education, where you know at one point we had half of all health consultations in this country happening virtually. Um, at one point, we had almost all students um, learning from home assisted by digital technology. These were changes that, um, Andrew, you and I have discussed for many years, e-commerce, e-education, e-health, but there's always been some uh, barrier, technology um, or cultural barrier to those things happening. And then suddenly, with a health pandemic, we've seen businesses and organisations transform uh, overnight. So out of all those range of different investments and pivots by business, which ones of these do you think are going to be the, the lasting legacy? How has the business environment and the technology environment changed forever? Look, I think it has changed forever. Um, we're likely to see some of the changes revert back to normal. Yes, some people will come back into the office when they can. Some people want to see their GP. Um, we've obviously, um, uh, in New South Wales, seen most students return to, to, um, to schooling uh, on campus rather than online. So some of the changes will be unwound, um, but some of the changes will be permanent, particularly where businesses have, inv have invested in digital technology and they know there's a new and better way of doing things, whether that's e-commerce, remote working, um, or, or other items like that. I think there's a certain familiarity with which the average worker or the average Australian now has with technology, greater familiarity, which will encourage them, make it easier for them to, to take the next digital step. And I think that'll be one of the big legacies of this di rapid digitisation during COVID-19. So when we look at this year's data, what stands out to you? What are the key attributes of the technology workforce here in Australia? I mean, you've got, it's a very big workforce. It's 772,000 tech workers that we have in this country. Um, we, did, we did one other calculation in this year's report. We think that by 2027, we're gonna have 1 million tech workers in this country. It's a, it's a, it's a very strong achievement um, for Australia. Um, a lot of those jobs that we've seen the strongest growth in have been the technical and professional IT jobs, more so than some of the support workers or, or lower skilled tech jobs. So it's very much at the upper end where the tech jobs have been created. The other key attribute is the growth of tech workers working outside of traditional tech companies. So while half of tech workers in this country work in, in tech businesses, a lot don't. They work in other businesses that might be in professional services or healthcare, education, uh, in the agricultural sector or elsewhere. And that's a really good thing so that as our economy generally grows, there'll be lots of opportunities for, for, for IT workers. Um, there are a few items where I think the country could do better um, uh, in terms of the diversity of its, of its IT workforce. There are, um, there are around 29% of Australia's IT workers are women, which is lower than what it is for professional industries overall. Um, uh, older workers are also underrepresented in the tech workforce compared with professional industries overall. Um, and this is the first edition where we do geographic mapping of Australia's IT workforce. Now, of course, it won't be of surprise to anybody who's on the, on the line tonight to see that um, a lot of those workers are concentrated in our capital cities and even within those in specific tech hotspots, Northwest Sydney, uh, Eastern Melbourne, Inner Brisbane, this is where a lot of our tech workers are based. But I think um, as an aspiration, it would be nice to see more tech workers in other areas um, and in regional areas in this country as well. Oh, I love the digital intensity maps that are included with this year's report. Um, you touched on in the introduction the education space, so a little bit more detail around how the supply side has been performing. Mm. Look, this is very interesting and I think it's going to change a lot in the next couple of years as well. Um, we've got a new 
uh, a chart in this year's report that tries to understand where is this growth in our tech workforce coming from. Um, we've added 50,000 IT workers um, to our workforce in the past 12 months. About half of them we know approximately where they came from by looking at domestic students who've graduated with an IT degree, international students who've graduated with um, an IT degree. We've got a certain proportion who are coming through on temporary visas joining the workforce. Um, but there are a lot still that are coming from other parts of the workforce, permanent migrants um, or people with uh, a TAFE or similar um, qualifications um, where we're not able to put a figure on it. But only about half of that net growth of 50,000 um, uh, extra workers can we put a finger on with a sense of where they're coming from. But a lot of workers are just transitioning from other, other, other um, uh, professional employment, other, other, professional, other professional jobs. I think that's going to change in the next few years. We're going to see an increasing share coming from our universities, I think. Enrolments in universities um, in, tech, in tech degrees have increased a lot over the past 10 years. When we first started work, doing this work with the ACS, um, uh, 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 tech degree enrolments um, had fallen off a cliff. In 2001, we had, a, we had a peak and 10 years later, it had fallen dramatically. Um, yet over the last five or six years, we've seen almost all of that decline recover. And there's now been a 50% increase from that low in our, in our tech degree enrolments. So as that pipeline comes through, that's a really good thing um, for tech workforce growth. Um, so that'll be higher. But at the, on the other side, we will see fewer tech workers coming from um, migration, whether that's temporary or from permanent migrants because of course the borders are closed. Um, and we aren't sure at this stage how permanent that impact will be. Um, we'd love to see more of a contribution from, from TAFE as well, diplomas, Cert 3, Cert 4 um, qualified um, people as well. Um, but the, as the charts in the report show, uh, enrolments in those types of qualifications has actually been in decline for the last few years. So um, there's going to be, need to be a big change in 2021 and 2022 if um, TAFE qualified candidates are to contribute to the growth that we need to see. In Chapter 4, we're focused on the established productivity benefits of digital technology as well as the future productivity benefits. Do you just want to cover that for us at a high level? Look, this is the big driver for why uh, our tech workforce is growing, our tech sector is growing. It's because businesses are finding it beneficial um, to be using uh, uh, new technologies. Um, some of it is everyday things, um, just improving communication between workers and customers, increased uh, collaboration tools. We've got figures in the report showing what the time savings are of using um, digital technologies, what the productivity benefits are for individual workers using um, collaboration uh, tools. So they're very significant. Um, but the other big driver for productivity benefits comes from the competition between businesses which technology enables. Now you might think of that most simply as businesses selling online and of course consumers having more choice and that of course forces businesses to be to compete more and to be more um, productive but it also facilitates new market entrance and you think of online service providers or online platforms and it's easy to think of say Airbnb or Uber in that space as well where um, uh, that's going to create a lot more competition and it's going to drive a lot more um, productivity too. Um, coming down the pipeline, um, I think that uh, AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning um, and big data are likely to be big sources of productivity growth um, in, this, uh, uh, in this country. Lots of applications, whether that's in uh, e-invoicing, data in, uh, in our transport sector, in our mining sector, um, uh, AI in our health sector. Um, one of the things that Deloitte's been um, uh, proud to be a part of um, during COVID-19 is working with the superannuation industry on an AI-powered um, superbot um, to help their websites produce chatbots that can help respond to customer inquiries. I mean, you can imagine um, the, the change in superannuation firms earlier this year when the government announced that people would be able to um, take money, withdraw money early from their superannuation funds. You know, suddenly, you know, the old call centres, the old email response systems that super 
businesses had were inadequate to respond to these thousands of inquiries which they were getting. They needed a digital solution to help them through that period and they created a chatbot that was able to get them through that period. Obviously a very big productivity boost compared to putting on you know, hundreds of staff to be responding to all of these inquiries. So there's lots of opportunities big and small for, 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 for digital technology to lift productivity in this country, which of course I'm sure um, uh, people uh, are watching tonight would be familiar with, but um, achieving a productivity increase is when a business is able to do more with less or more with the same amount, i.e. it's able to get more output, more cans of baked beans for fewer machines and, and workers, and technology and information is a key part of improving productivity in businesses. Measuring ICT's contribution to the Australian economy has always been a bit of a challenge. Uh, shout out to ACS fellow Ian Dennis, who's uh, assisted with some number crunching this year. Just want to talk us through um, some numbers that you have in the report about that contribution. The ICT sector has been a very significant contributor to the economy, um, but it's but it's, a, it's, its hero status has not always been well recognised. The traditional um, Australian Bureau of Statistics catalogues that have tried to uh, understand technology uh, growth have been discontinued and we don't have a very good picture of the, uh, of the size of the, of the sector. Um, it's hidden really amongst other classifications. And this is something which, as you said, uh, uh, Ian Dennis has recognised for many years and championed. Um, uh, better measurement of Australia's ICT uh, sector. Um, one way of measuring it, um, which uh, uh, Ian Dennis has done using a, uh, a, a tool he developed with um, uh, the CIIER, is to understand its contribution to GDP. And, and, and Ian Dennis's estimate there is $56 billion. That is to say, if, if ICT was a sector in its own right, it would be it would be incredibly um, significant. So that's, yeah, it's a very big number. Um, and it, it would be um, up there with Australia's major industries if it was recorded that way. Now you touched on it just slightly during the introduction, but forecasts going forward, how many ICT workers are we going to need and how will we get there? Well, um, it's gonna be a long road over the next five years for us to pile on an extra 156,000 IT workers by 2025 is going to take effort from uh, uh, universities, um, from people moving between industries, um, and probably some migration once the borders um, open up as well. So that's going to that's going to change the landscape. We'll need workers in all the key technology areas: data scientists, um, uh, uh, cloud professionals, um, uh, uh, systems architects. Um, and cyber skills. Um, uh, as Australia faces growing cyber threats, we'll need more workers in that area as well. I think one of the key numbers that Digital Pulse has been synonymous with over the last five years has been that 100,000 shortfall of workers. So going to this year and having 156, that's a big jump. Um, but let's put it into some context. Um, how have you measured, how have your, your forecast stacked up over the last five years? There's a table there specific, and uh, it's good to see that you've been conservative and uh, that this number um, is more likely to be on the low side. It could well be, um, uh, Andrew. Yes, we are very transparent with our audience and with, our, with your membership that, um, that the forecasts have very much um, underdone what the growth was expected to be um, over the last five years. And it's there in, in maybe not black and white, it might be in, in green, black and white, um, in the report, but yes, if you were to go back to that first report, we might have been expecting that today we would have 700,000 IT workers, and it turns out we've got almost 800,000, um, significantly underestimating the likely growth, because if you look across different industries, there just aren't other professions that are growing to the same extent as tech workers, and that's why if you look across the economy, um, you can underestimate it. Um, we are expecting there to be some fall this year, just because of the the macroeconomic impacts of COVID-19. Of COVID I think it's about 35,000 fewer workers at the, at the lowest point, um, but then that will, that will uh, be reversed once the economy recovers. Um, and, then obviously we'll, and then obviously we'll head back up again, I think um, somewhere towards about 930,000 by, by 2025. Um, 
I mean, we have managed to meet those demands over the last few years, but as we've discussed many times, Andrew, um, it's been it's been done by people moving between occupations, which we need to do more of, but also a lot of migration, a lot of migration, a lot of permanent migrants, and a lot of um, migrants on temporary visas as well. And that's a that's an okay solution as a short-term solution um, because we need these workers for our tech growth and migrants have provided a wonderful contribution to the country. But if we do have this technology need and we do have a lot more people who will be looking for work, um, you'd think that we'd be missing a trick as a country if we didn't take the opportunity to boost our education so that Australians were able to take those opportunities. You've also got some interesting numbers there around international comparisons and the 156,000 is a key up with current forecast demand. But to become a world leader, there's an interesting comparison with the UK. What, what does that involve? Yeah, um, if you look around the world, um, Australia is not a, an international leader in, in, in digital. Um, it's got some aspects, some parts of our, of, our, of our IT sector are absolutely world leading. Businesses, um, workers, the technology that we use, and the growth in our exports. Um, in recent years, um, but in many ways um, we're off the pace, middle of the pack according to our, our, um, our assessment. We looked at 24 different indicators compared against 16 countries. Um, on, the, on the comparisons with two years ago, in half of the indicators we actually went backwards even though we've been growing very strongly. Um, some of the areas we could be doing better are in our, um, our exports of, of, um, of, of IT services um, and IT goods. Um, it's hard to imagine us being a world leader without doing that better. Um, we might talk a bit more about businesses. But yes, on the workforce front, um, the skills of our workers are very good. The thing is we just need a lot more IT workers for us to be considered an international leader. And we just looked at, I think the UK and Singapore have very high um, uh, 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 numbers of people in IT. Uh, I think it's 9% by one estimate in the UK compared with 6% in Australia. We would need to not have 156,000 workers in the next five years, we would need to double that growth if we wanted to be a world leader, at least in terms of like, IT workers, that's one measure, but we would, we would need a lot more growth to be an international leader in that area. Okay then, so let's plead the case on the reskilling opportunity. How do the economics stack up? The economics are very, are very clear here that um, workers have a lot of benefit potentially on the table if they're able to move into a technology role. They might be outside of technology at the moment, they might want to upskill within a technology job, or they might be a, a young Australian entering university. Um, technology workers are paid well in this country um, and paid better in general than other similar professional careers. Um, we estimate it's about an extra $10,000 a year wage premium that comes with having tech skills. Now, if you were to compare that with the, with the cost of doing um, a, 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 a course in, that would help a, a worker shift from another professional job to IT, to be told you're going to be paid from the beginning 10,000 more every year, um, that's a pretty big, pretty big dividend. Um, and I know there are a lot of online um, providers and traditional education institutions doing a lot in this space. One that I'm familiar with and one that we feature in the report is um, RMIT Online, um, which is, which is specialising in digital courses. It develops its courses with tech companies. I know it does it with a, uh, AWS, with Adobe, with, uh, with REA, um, to produce courses that are really relevant to get people straight into jobs. Um, so uh, uh, this is a message, probably not for people on the line tonight, right, because they're the people with the tech skills, but more broadly in the economy, there is a really big dividend for people to move into, into technology. The report references previous Deloitte Access Economic work around what does digital leadership look like. Can you just cover off some of those key themes? So how can we become uh, an international um, leader? Um, well, uh, we've covered workforce a lot tonight, so obviously that could be stronger, and we've briefly covered exports. Um, but it's Australian businesses that are going to need to play a big role for us to be a leader in this space as well. We need more technology com companies in this country if we're going to be considered a, um, a heavy hitter um, in this space. Um, 
we've got a we've got one high level uh, illustrative chart um, in the in in the report this year, just looking at the biggest companies in Australia and in the U.S. I think it's 50 years ago compared with now. And of course, in Australia, I think we've got one of our top 10 companies is a is is a technology company. They might have been there 50 years ago, but they're a they're a privatised. Um, former government uh, company, whereas in the US, you know, their their top, their largest companies is dominated by technology companies. Now, between Canva, Atlassian, um, uh, NextDC, and other businesses, we do have you know some world-leading tech businesses in this country, and we've got a lot that are um, mid-size and small businesses as well. I know the the you know the the cyber ecosystem of businesses is something that's been growing, and that's a big economic opportunity. But having more businesses that are technology businesses and measured measured that way um, is going to uh, help us be a digital leader. And then the other component is is just other businesses adopting the latest technologies. They mightn't necessarily be developing it themselves, um, but adopting it's going to be very important. 12 months ago, um, sitting in the chair opposite you, um, Andrew Johnson, was Paul Krugman, the Nobel Prize winning uh, uh, economist. And you were having a conversation with him about, about how we could be a leader. And I remember he, he had a remark to you, which was something like, um, it's not just about what Silicon Valley is doing, it's about what all the other businesses are doing with the technologies developed in Silicon Valley. So I think that's the other point. It's, it's how are just other businesses across the economy using technology that'll help us be a digital leader. So a dedicated section then on looking at artificial intelligence, both creation and adoption. Yes. Um, what would be some of your high level comments about how Australia is um, compared to other nations in terms of artificial intelligence? Look, the caveat I'd put on this comparison is that we are looking at leading countries, some of the biggest economies in the world, the US, China, France, uh, Germany, Canada. We look at seven economies, um, but with that caveat, it makes for very sobering reading, these comparisons. If you look at how Australia is performing, other countries are taking AI really seriously. They recognise that this is the next big technology boom. And I'm not sure that that's the case in Australia. We look at three different measures of uh, AI um, readiness. One of them is just about current maturity levels inside businesses. Do they have a strategy around AI? Are they doing anything about it? And Australia is towards the bottom of that list. We look at the sense of urgency um, about whether businesses are ready to take the next step. And again, we find Australia is towards the bottom of that list. And then thirdly, we look at the perceived challenges to adopting AI more. Well, of course, Australia is very high on that list, but that's a bad thing in that there are bigger challenges here to adopting AI. Bigger cyber skills gaps, bigger concerns about adopting AI. Now, they may not be unreasonable, those, those concerns to do with ethical issues and, and data privacy and all those things. I mean, they're not, un, they're not unreasonable things for people to be worried about. But they're things we have to deal with, not just be worried about if we're going to be a leader in this space. I think we quote um, um, one, of our, um, one of our colleagues in this space about the potential opportunity there, and I think it's, it could be 13 billion, it could be 13 trillion dollars is the economic opportunity. It's massive. What could, what's going to come down the line through, through artificial intelligence you know, in the next five or 10 years? So one final question before I throw over to ACS members. The report finishes with six public policy imperatives. Um, do you want to just touch on each of those for us? Yes, I will. Um, just in, in preview to that, I would congratulate um, the ACS, um, its leadership in advocating for policy change in this country. I know that some of the items that we've brought up in previous editions um, have made their way into public deb policy debates. Um, the, the, the research has has, and, and, and the ACS's advocacy has absolutely changed the position of, of technology workers and careers in this country. And I'm sure that's part of the reason why we've seen that big lift in university enrolments in technology over the last 10 years. Um, we've seen uh, uh, mu much more uh, technology and digital skills um, taught in our schools. Um, and that was something that came up in one of the first editions of, of the ACS Digital Pulse report. Um, we've seen a Senate Select Committee recently recently jump on board the ACS's suggestion around early stage innovation uh, companies um, to, to make it more competitive with other, 
with other policy regimes around the world. What do we talk about this year? Um, well, the most important one during this crisis, this COVID-19 crisis, is upskilling and reskilling our workforce. Doing that in 2021 and in 2022. So as the recovery takes hold, we will be best place to take advantage of it. So I think some of the government's announcements about short-term uh, skilling programs have been good, uh, but there's going to need to be more of that um, in the next year or two for us to take to take forward the opportunities. There's a few areas in, in small businesses where I think that um, our policy um, uh, could be enhanced. Some of these, some of this is just about uh, uh, expanding what the government's already doing. The Small Business Digital Champions Program, just as an example, one I'm familiar with, is about helping small businesses adopt more technology um, using, uh, using um, Australian uh, IT workers. Um, uh, that could be, I think, expanded. And there are, there are other areas for small business to do with um, uh, employee uh, share schemes. Um, and, uh, and the final one that I'll, I'll just briefly mention as well is recognising the importance of this sector um, is, uh, is, is very important. Um, the ABS has discontinued its catalogues uh, in this area and really we're walking into a, we're walking into a technology future without really knowing what that workforce and, uh, and, that, and that business sector looks like. And, and this is one that um, I know Ian Dennis has been very um, passionate about um, in the last few years. Just better recognising this sector um, would be, I think, great for um, the IT uh, sector's future in this country. Thank you, John. So I've got lots of member questions coming in. Question from Manu Bardwaj. As you said, Australia will have more than 900,000 IT workers by 2025. How ready and prepared is the Australian IT industry for this growth in terms of employment? They're the ones who are demanding it, is, is the response to that question. So I think they are prepared. I think, the, um, I think if I was just to think about the balance here between what businesses wanted and what the workforce was ready for, I think the problem that we've had um, in the last few years and will continue to have is whether, whether the workforce is ready for what businesses, are, what businesses are demanding. I know, just to give one example, um, there was a lot greater business demand for IT trainers and IT support staff during the COVID-19 crisis. Not surprisingly, there are all these digital changes going on. Hey, we need more tech workers. So I think that, that businesses are definitely ready um, to absorb and demand these workers, demand not, 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 in a, not in a demanding sense, I just mean in an economic sense of, of, um, of wanting these workers on board. Um, uh, they probably could think you know, a, a bit more about what those workforces look like inside their businesses to make sure that they're you know, part of operations that they're part of all the decision making inside businesses, that they're not just in a, um, uh, you know, not just in a technology department inside a business. Um, I think that would be a good change to see inside business these days because the reality is that most businesses these days are digital businesses. It's not a separate area inside businesses. So I think, um, I, uh, I think that could be improved in, inside a lot of businesses. Question from Ashraf Atia. Working from home and learning from home must have an impact on other business streams such as commercial rents. Your thoughts on that front? Yeah, um, no, it is true that um, there will be winners and losers from this change. You know, it could relate to um, commercial real estate um, in our cities. It could relate to businesses whose business models have been structured around the old way. They might be, um, they might be owners of parking lots um, in the city. They might be toll road owners. Um, they might be um, hospitality um, businesses that are structured around our CBDs as well. So, I mean, we've had a model that for a long time has prioritised getting people in and out of CBDs every day. And if we do see um, the working from home trend continue into the future in a permanent way, more so than what it was, um, prior to the prior to the crisis, then that's going to that's going to mean a lot of other business adjustments as well. We're going to we will see more hospitality businesses in the suburbs. Um, we will see um, you know rents affected across different areas as well. So the fallout of that's going to be very interesting to watch over the next few years. 
Um, dry cleaning businesses, just on a personal note, I'm sure are going to be hard hit by this. Um, the number of people who are happy to iron their shirts at home, I know, is, and, and, and blouses, I should say, um, I'm sure has, um, has increased a lot during the COVID-19 crisis. Question from Jan Kornwebel. Does the report advise how to improve diversity for including more women, older people, neurodiverse individuals? I think that's I think that that's a very good that's a very good question. It's a very it's a very important point, and I appreciate um, your your ACS member there mentioning neurodiverse individuals as well. It is something that we've started to look at um, at Deloitte in research terms to understand that there are lots of dimensions of diversity. Some of them are easier to measure than others. Um, just to mention a couple of others, it can be difficult to get good statistics about culturally and linguistically diverse Australians and also LGBTIQ Australians precisely because someone's surname doesn't automatically indicate what their background is um, and it can be hard to identify neurodiverse individuals as well. So it can be a harder thing to measure but there are lots of different areas of diversity um, that will be important. We don't propose anything in this report but in some of our previous reports um, we have um, looked at that and we have made some suggestions um, for businesses about taking a more open mind about, about keeping on effectively some of their older um, IT workers um, and I know a former ACS president um, has been a particularly particularly strong advocate for, for, um, for, for, for that one. Um, for women in IT it's, it's very important that it happens early and that's why the ACS's campaign to strengthen perceptions amongst young girls that tech can be their future has been so important because it's at that early stage of usually around kind of year eight or year nine when um, uh, ch children, year eight or year nine at school, when they move from being just generalists at school to start thinking about what their future could look like. And there still are a lot of stereotypes that persist about what are considered to be boy subjects and girl subjects. And you know, often by the time a student is 17 and they've already decided to focus on you know, non-technology um, subjects, if they haven't been taking high level maths, physics or other similar subjects, they're really not, they're, they're not mentally ready to be thinking about taking on a, a, um, a technology uh, a, a university offering. So that's why we've made some suggestions about um, uh, uh, government programs to um, promote tech, tech careers amongst uh, young Australian women, the, uh, the girls, they're, you know, at the ages of kind of, you know, 12, 13, 14, that kind of, that kind of zone. The digital worker intensity maps are very much metropolitan centric. Um, given that higher paying jobs can happen with, through technology, what sort of policy levers might government have to create more jobs in technology in regional areas? Regions have undergone really tough times when we think about the fires and now COVID-19. Uh, how can we stimulate and have more technology workers in regional areas? I think it's a very good, oh, look, I think it's a great question and we'd love to maybe tackle that uh, maybe in a future edition of, um, of, of ACS Digital Pulse. Unfortunately, I don't have a great answer for that that, that, that question th this evening. Um, beyond what I'm sure your your audience would know, a kind of fairly standard fare for for policy in that area. But um, diversifying um, uh, where government itself is established can be an important um, uh, aspect of, of of moving certain types of jobs, professional jobs, technology jobs, out of capital cities, so they can be based in regional cities or even in some towns. Um, it is possible to move certain aspects of government out. There, there may be in investment incentives um, which are needed um, in order to get businesses to relocate. Um, and then the other way is to try to build up businesses or business parks around our regionally based universities. In a, in a lot of regional areas, the biggest opportunity there will be to grow a technology workforce will be around a university and its businesses that it could attract. And you know, you might think of the University of Wollongong is just one example of that, but there are a few of them. Um, you'll need some starting point, either a government anchor, anchor tenant or a university really to get that ecosystem going. I mean, it's unlikely that a big tech business is just going to, you know, um, show up in a town that doesn't have any, you know, any kind of tech businesses at all. So th they would be starting points, but I admit that's a very inadequate answer to the, to the very smart question.
Question from David Allen. Could we focus more on innovation to improve our international standing in cyber security, ICT performance and business benefits? Well, absolutely. I mean, the key to us moving forward will be, will be innovation. The question is, where, will, where is that likely to come from? We need the workers to do it. We'll need businesses to be investing. Uh, and we also need um, uh, uh, competition and the need, that is, you know, to drive it. We also need to remove some of the barriers to innovation. Um, and they might be at the managerial level. They might be regulation that's coming from, from government. That's, you know, they can be barriers to innovation too. But we will absolutely have to innovate our way out of seven out of 16 if we want to be, you know, say, in the top five or the top few nations around the world for, for, for IT leadership. Question from Glenn Lee. What do you consider are the most risky assumptions with your forecasts in these uncertain times? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And we, we, would, we, we would like to be as transparent about that um, as, we, as we can be. Look, the first really big unknown is how long the COVID-19 recession goes for. Um, we've got three scenarios um, which we have um, in our modelling, our overall macroeconomic modelling, um, you know, which are basically you know, a fairly light, a medium or a fairly heavy scenario in terms of the downturn. Um, but none of our models from last year predicted we were going to have COVID-19. And to pretend that we had you know, a crystal ball um, that was going to accurately predict how long this was going to go on for would be you know, obviously you know, um, you know, uh, fairly heroic for us. So the length of the COVID-19 downturn is a really big uncertainty. The second big uncertainty is about international borders that with migration playing such a strong role in Australia's growing IT workforce, whether, the bo whether international borders stay closed for six months, 12 months or two years, it's gonna have a huge impact on our ability to meet some of the targets which we're talking about. And then a third, com a third uncertainty which I'd point to is, it's very difficult to say at this stage what digital changes will be permanent, what digital changes will revert back to old ways of working. If they're permanent and things continue to change, then the demand for IT services and skills and workers is going to continue to grow. But if that was to revert more, you know, more significantly than what we expect, then obviously that's going to, that, that, that's going to mean that the growth won't be there. Question from Stephen Pereira. Is Australia companies in danger of losing our IT talent to other countries if Australian companies and governments ignore the price of IT professionals? Ignore the, sorry, the last bit, ignore the price of IT professionals, yeah. Um, so will I, our highly skilled workers yeah. disappear to bigger opportunities overseas? Um, look, it is true that um, particularly the kind of the top talent, the gold collar workers will be hotly in demand um, uh, around the world. And um, previous international um, transit analysis that we've done for, I think it was two years ago for, for ACS, in the ACS um, Digital Pulse showed that, yep, absolutely, there are some opportunities in the UK, in the US and elsewhere that are taking you know, thousands of Australian workers um, uh, each year. And Australia could do a better job of making sure that there are opportunities for those, um, those workers uh, in Australia. But it will probably be, mm, I think, more of a responsibility of businesses to be creating those opportunities rather than, than government per se. They're not, I don't think they're likely to be people working in government. They might be. But I think if we want to create you know, a few more Atlassians and Canvas, that's going to create more opportunities for, for workers um, to stay in Australia. Um, but I'd also consider the overall equation that we are, we are also frankly taking a lot of the talent from overseas. Um, yes, a lot are from India, um, but there are also a lot from the US and from the UK which are coming to Australian sh shores as well. And I don't think we can, you know, absorb that talent uh, and, uh, and, you know, and kind of think we're in the right while they're not also, you know, respecting the fact that some people are going to find um, opportunities, you know, find opportunities overseas. Yeah. Question from Cathy Cheng. What potential opportunities of AI can be applied in Australia? Lots of them. Uh, lots of opportunities for AI um, uh, uh, in Australia. I think if I was to you know, take you through the 18 main um, uh, industry uh, classification, uh, industries which we have in our classification structure, there'll be ones you know, in all of them. If, I, if we were to walk onto a farm and want to get a better prediction for when it's likely to rain, 
or if we would like to better understand, you know, um, uh, 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 cattle movements, you know, around a farm, there'll be AI um, for that. There'll be um, opportunities in mining, you know, and it might relate to, you know, mine safety or the responses of workers to uh, different policies that, that mine operators put in place. Um, in electricity, gas and water, it might be about um, uh, fixing pipes or predicting, you know, where you're likely to have problems with the network, you know, depending on, you know, the age of, um, of, uh, of, of, of pipes or sewage or other things. Um, and, uh, and that could be extended to electricity as well. So um, uh, AI, that is being able to use data smartly in a predictive way to improve decision making is something that we should be able to see across the board. I can most easily think of its applications in, I suppose, what you might call traditional industries, the ones I've mentioned, but also in um, transport, in wholesale, in telecommunications. Um, but we'll also see it in people industries as well. You know, there, there'll be AI applications for predicting health pandemics, just as an example, in healthcare. Um, there'll be ways in which AI can help us better understand the student experience at universities and how universities um, can better identify when they're likely to be cohorts of students that are um, uh, not performing well and what strategies might help um, them improve over time as well. Um, but I'm probably less familiar with those. But um, Certainly in traditional industries that are already pretty capital intensive, um, the shift to AI will, will be probably more seamless for them. Employing them in areas where you're providing services to people, healthcare, education, um, social services, aged care, for example, I think that's, they're the areas where you're likely to see some of those ethical issues arise a little bit more as well. And then obviously there'll be a bit of a creepy factor that kind of turns people off you know, using AI for certain things. Um, and there is, still a, there is still community resistance to, to some of these areas, like if I, just to mention, you know, chatbots or live chat, uh, well, actually chatbots, not live chat, um, uh, functions on websites. Some people just, they don't like using them because they think it's creepy. Uh, definition question from Graham Bond, what is a digital business? Digital business, um, they're classified by the ABS this way. Um, there are two big categories, computer systems design. It sounds like a definition that's 20 years old because it is a definition that's 20 years old and there's telecommunication services in there too. So if a business, it's uh, how, the, how the Australian Bureau of Statistics does it is, is it works out what's the main thing a business is doing and then it lumps it in one of 18 industries and then it lumps it in under these 18 industries, these, 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 these kind of sub-industries. Um, but as a result of that, there are a lot of businesses that are very digital that will still not appear as digital businesses. If I was to just give one um, very self-interested example, I'd consider Deloitte, which is the business that I work in. Now, inside Deloitte, we've got lots of little businesses. I'm an economist and I work at Deloitte Access Economics. Um, but then we've got a big area which is called Deloitte Digital. I mean, it employs hundreds of technology businesses. But we all show up in the category, category called accounting services under professional services. So all those digital workers, even though they effectively work for a digital business, will all be a... Um, will all be just considered in an accounting business by, by, by the ABS. So the answer to the question is, um, uh, according to the ABS, you have to be a business whose main activity is, 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 is producing technology products or providing technology services. Um, that is either telecommunications or that, that, that other awkward category that I mentioned earlier. But I think, Amongst, amongst the audience tonight, I'd say that that ABS definition is out of date, as Ian Dennis has identified, and we really need to have a better measure so we can take into account these other businesses that we're talking about. Question from Chris Johnson. Can we humanise the technology to be more attractive and more effective? This is critical. This is absolutely critical. So I was, um, I was talking to the, uh, the, the, the chair of the, um, the ACS about this a few years ago, and um, uh, one of the big dividends of talking about problem solving in, in digital technology is it is likely to widen um, uh, interest in technology careers amongst young people, particularly amongst young women, um, to the extent that it's helping people, 
it's solving social problems. Um, it's not just the kind of stereotype of sitting on a keyboard and, 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 and doing coding. That's likely to, to kind of widen interest in, in, um, in, in technology careers. And there was a little bit more to that question as well, Andrew, wasn't there? Uh, can we humanise the technology to be more attractive and more effective? Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, uh, humans prefer to interact with things that are user-friendly. So I think humanising technology will absolutely make it more effective because it'll make it easier for people to, um, to, to, to take it up. The, the, only, the, only, the only counterpoint to that I'd mention is that I do understand that with virtual assistants, there has been an effort made to to hold back from making them perfect counterfeits of humans, recognising that people are talking to a computer and they should know that they're talking to a computer and that there's a certain line that we cross if we make them too human and that's just making sure that they kind of still look like a, a fake human is, is, an, in, is an important thing. Um, but yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure the person who asked that question had a much um, uh, broader and creative view about how we could humanise technology than just those two examples that, that I've given. Question from Stephen Goodwin. How can or slash could crowdsourcing skill from within ACS help boost growth? What do you think, what type of growth do you think, uh, Andrew, w we should be trying to get at with that uh, question? Uh, in the current environment would be more employment, more rapid deployment and um, higher paying jobs would be my. So anytime there's a lull um, using the ACS membership, of which there's now 50,000 plus uh, right across the country and including internationally, uh, and crowdsourcing models have, are becoming more and more prevalent across a range of different areas, how might that be applied in Australia's economy? It's funny, crowdsourcing was a big idea about I mean, it was really popular kind of five or six years ago. It seemed like it was going to be the next big thing. Um, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm an observer of that, not someone who's analysed it a lot um, more recently, um, or even at the time, in fact. Um, but I haven't, heard of, I haven't heard quite so much about it lately. I mean, it's, it's an idea that has a lot of potential. I can really see its applications in tapping into the ACS membership base more strongly in order to uncover insights about what's happening. Um, it might be about technology skill needs. It might be about business growth opportunities. It might be about opportunities for policy change uh, as well. Um, how I would say is it's something like, it's the story behind the statistics. I mean, this report has more numbers, you know, than you could, you know, throw a keyboard at. The report is 100 pages long, Andrew, this year. It's the longest ACS digital pulse ever. 30 pages are just literally tables and data. It's got more appendix, appendices than any report that we, that we write. But at the same time, we would recognise that in just producing those high level numbers, it doesn't mean that we have every insight about a particular skill need or business opportunity or policy change. So I think getting more input from the, the membership, crowdsourcing those ideas is, is a really good one. Well, for me, in those tables in the back, you know, we can see that ICT services, uh, the export dollars, has grown more than 42%. We have a trade surplus now of 770 million. I'm not sure that any other sector would be achieving that sort of uh, growth. So it's certainly uh, very positive. Another question from Ashraf. AI, as you say, needs good data, integral and trusted. What were your findings on the data health in Australia? Um, look, one of the concerns that we have is about people using data. Um, we spoke to Data for the People, an organisation you know, established to try to provide more insights in this area. Three quarters of Australian workers are uncomfortable working with data. That's not just tech workers, admittedly, that's all workers, but that's an astonishing figure. That means there are people in payroll or in HR or in marketing who are uncomfortable using data. I mean, it is hard to imagine any kind of corporate job these days not involving, you know, a fairly hefty number of, um, even if it's just spreadsheets, just basically looking through and saying, you know, what are the trends? Um, how should this influence our decision? I mean, pretty much every professional job is going to involve, you know, some sort of, you know, data analysis or, or interpretation. So I think one of the biggest limitations that we have is, is potentially not having um, data literacy 
at the level um, that, it, that it needs to be. Um, data quality, that's been mentioned by businesses to us as well. And I know that that's what the, the, the questioner asked about. Data quality has been mentioned uh, as, an, as an issue as well. It's because people will have legacy systems and they'll hold different information sources in different areas. I, I, I used to work for a New South Wales government agency about, um, oh, about 10 years ago. And I was astonished to find that um, just just wanted to compare. I can't. I can't give. I don't want to give too much away from it because I was I was working for the government. But so I won't mention the agency's name. But I could just two different two different aspects, two different lenses of looking at the one particular object that we were regulating. I mean, you absolutely had to compare X with Y in order to make your interpretation. But they were in different systems, so it, it meant that um, you needed a special. Um, uh, data scientist to be stitching together these data sets every time you wanted to produce one report rather than just having them in the system. So not having the right systems in place is going to affect data quality. I of course was at least one of the people who's relatively happy playing with data. So I was in the 25% not the 75%. Final question for tonight John. Federal Treasurer um, has had all the pictures, all the portfolios are putting their bids for the budget coming up. Gone through the expenditure review committee and it's uh, sharp on pencil time. What would you like Josh Frydenberg to think about before he signs off on his next budget, particularly from a technology investment perspective? Look, just one that's, one that's um, come to my attention recently that I think would be very worthwhile for policy consideration is the digital games industry in this country. It's an area where um, uh, adjacent industries like cinema or post-production and digital effects receive far more generous um, uh, policy support than what Australia's games industry does. A lot of, a lot, uh, there are a lot of digital workers work in the um, digital games industry. I'm sure you've got ACS members um, in that sector. Um, but the policy support isn't quite, maybe, isn't, isn't quite what it is in other similar sorts of industries. So I think taking a look at that would be, um, uh, that would be an interesting change to see. It's an area where Australia could do um, better for providing services in this country, but it could also be an export opportunity um, as well. So I know that the Treasurer has a lot of things, he'll have a lot obviously of competing demands on his plate because um, he'll be stimulating the economy, there'll be infrastructure projects to fund. Um, I think he needs to produce um, uh, policies that don't just support, here's a one-liner for you, that don't just support shovel-ready projects, but also support click-ready projects. I know, I know, that's, that's, um, that sounds a bit naff. But just one area that I just saw recently, the digital games industry, I thought, oh, look, just running a ruler over that and seeing if, there are, if, if uh, it could do with some more policy support would be worthwhile to check out. So that was hashtag click ready projects. Everyone get on board and start pushing out through your social channels. John, can I just say thank you to you, uh, John Omani, and also Nick Hull and the rest of the broader team at Deloitte Access Economics. Um, year six of Digital Pulse, it's now live on the ACS website. Members, please help yourself by downloading and we're really looking forward to the next 12 months to see which of these policy ideas can get traction and make a positive impact for Australian society. That's it for tonight, folks. Can I just say, don't forget to join us next Thursday night. Industry Insights is back with AJ Bartia from Car Sales, Managing Director for Australia. We look forward to seeing you then.